Welcome to Outstanding Women Leaders OWL podcast. I'm your host, Katie L. Eads, founder and chief OWL at Outstanding Women Leaders OWL Professional Coaching, an organization dedicated to empowering women leaders to rewrite their story and reclaim their life. I'm on a mission to host 100 million witty and wise conversations that disrupt the way leaders think and the way the world lives in relationship to each other. This conversation is exactly what it needs to be in this moment in time. We've asked our guests to join us via video to allow us to create authentic connection. Eyes are the window to the soul. You will be seen here, you will be heard. There is space for you. When this conversation comes to a close, I will ask our guests three questions. If you've tuned in before, you know what they are. And if you haven't, you don't wanna miss them. <laughs> Today's outstanding, outstanding women leader is Marlene Chisholm, a seasoned speaker, thought partner, advisor, coach, author, and widely recognized as the leading U.S. authority on stopping workplace drama. She is the CEO of Marlene Chisholm Consulting and just released her book, From Conflict to Courage, How to Stop Avoiding and Start Leading, to help leaders develop the identity, mindsets, and skills needed to identify dysfunctional patterns, increase emotional integrity, promote personal responsibility, and work with structures to get business results. So many great things in this book, but even more exciting about Marlene is her start in the world. She did not start at the top. She did not start managing conflict. She started in a blue collar factory work and has reinvented and rewritten her story several times over. Marlene, welcome to Outstanding Women Leaders podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I'm so excited to talk with you about how you got your start. It's not every day that a woman... Uh, that is helping the CEO started out on the floor of their business, helping them. So tell us a little bit about how you uh, transitioned and, and what that was like for you. Well, I was a blue collar factory worker for 21 years and around midlife, like a lot of people, you go through what I call the three life tragedies. You want something more. So the first tragedy is, you know, you want something more, but you don't know what it is. Um, the second tragedy is you know what it is, but you don't believe it's possible. And then the third tragedy is you know what it is, you believe it's possible, but you have to be willing to make that shift. So what was going on for me goes on for a lot of people in that you start to feel discomfort and unhappiness. Like your, your comfort zone is just so worn out. You want something different, but it's so scary to get outside of it. And you don't think you can do it. And so I tell people that, you know, I did the same work every single day, worked by the same people packing cheese, stacking a skid, tearing down equipment for sanitation, driving a forklift. And I would say the best part of your day is when you look up at the clock and you realize it's time to rotate. <laughs> and so I wanted that something more. And I thought, well, I don't know what it is, but at least I can start that discovery phase. I can explore. So I started exploring and I was just saying, um, what's out there? What could I try? And I found Toastmasters and a lot of people know about Toastmasters. And I just had a lot of fun there. And that was my first glimmer. And so my first reinvention was that of becoming a professional speaker. And that was in the days when speakers got paid even at very beginning levels. That doesn't happen anymore. You speak for free to get consulting work. <laughs> you know, there are professional speakers, but it's not like it was when I started. So I got started getting paid right off the bat because I just started taking on that identity of what would a professional speaker do? How would they act? What would they, you know, what, how would they behave? What would they offer? And I got coaching like most people do. And so that was the beginning. And then when I got my first book, which was Stop Workplace Drama, that was sort of an act of God, I believe, too. That's just like the universe conspires to help you when you've made a decision. That was about 10, 11 years later. And I got it with Wiley, you know, without even having a, um, a, a, a contract, without having a, um, what do they call it, agent. I, I got it. That's a different story. But that is when I started becoming more successful. And then I evolved into like more coaching, consulting, training, that kind of stuff. It just sort of evolved on its own. And I have realized since then that really any next level shift, if you're struggling, it's due to your identity. Mm, so many good nuggets there. I want to unpack a little bit of it. First off, you join Toastmasters. I always encourage people to do something new, like the brain craves novelty and you took on that identity. I love that you describe that as just taking on the identity of what it looks like to be a paid speaker. And somewhere in that 10 year span that you mentioned, you got a master's degree in human resources. <laughs> <I did. laughs> 
<laughs> I did. I, because in that time when things would slow down, like they ultimately do in business, when you don't understand business and you don't understand marketing and continuing to keep it going, even when you're busy, you know, you would stop and go, okay, I've made it. No, you haven't. It's going to dry up in three months if you don't keep marketing. So when I would have those down times, I would hate that feeling of I'm not successful. I don't know what to do. So it seemed natural for me to go back to school because we had Webster University that had a sort of a remote location here. I had to go there. It wasn't on video, but they're located in St. Louis. I'm in Springfield, Missouri. And when I started taking that class, it was for something to do and to keep learning. And this was a shifting point for me. I didn't understand it at all. But when my professor, one of them said, if you'll go ahead and get your master's degree, you'll be you'll have to write a capstone. And what that's going to make you do is really form a body of work. It's going to make you research. It's going to make you come to conclusions. And in that body of work, you could be like Stephen Covey. You could have a whole body of work based on that. And I didn't even know what that meant. And I thought, wow, that seems like the island five million miles away. And I've got a rowboat one or a no map. But I thought, I'm just going to like kind of hear that. And I just started doing it the next right step. And then my capstone was called Drama in the Work place hampers productivity the effect of relationships on the bottom line that was my capstone and from there I started working with drama stop workplace drama no drama leadership seven ways to stop drama in your healthcare practice and now from conflict to courage from conflict to courage <laughs> how to stop avoiding and start leading so it did lead me to that path so sometimes it's listening to someone else who can see more for you than you see for yourself even if they have not done what you want to do Mm. And for me, it's so brave to go back to school and take on all of that work from someone that you didn't have a college degree when you were working in the factory. Well, I was, I started working on it at about age 30, but it wasn't working on it. I just went because I wanted something to do. And I was in that search that I was telling you about. So I, I actually didn't even think I was smart enough to pass a class. That's how my identity was at that point. My first class that I took was psychology. It changed my life because it taught me about patterns of thinking and being and behaving that there was some major dysfunction in my family of origin. What that did was open me up to this realization that we're not just the Adams family here. There, people have studied this stuff. This a lot of people have had these issues and these problems in their families. And I started getting so interested in how the mind works. And I started listening to Tony Robbins and motivational different ways of thinking that I had never been exposed to. Uh, Charles Givens, real estate, I didn't go into it, but it was just, I was on this exploration and I had never been exposed to that from my family of origin and from my small world. So it, I was working on it. And what happened was, after I'd been taking class after class after class, I went to my counselor and I said, have I got enough hours to have <laughs> completed anything? She goes, well, you've actually, you actually have an associate's degree. I didn't realize that. So once I had the associate's degree, that again, I was a blind man with a cane. I poked into a curb. Okay, you've got that. You could finish and go ahead and get a bachelor's. And that was my limited thinking. When I wanted to leave the factory, my limitations were so tight that all I really wanted was to quit wearing a uniform and a hairnet and to be able to paint my fingernails. Mm -hmm. That was my goal at that time, because that's how far I could see. I was in the fog. So the wonderful story for me is that, wow, how far I've come in those 22, 23 years. Um, wow, I've you know, written five books, master's degree, um, LinkedIn learning instructor. Those things have happened because of just poking into the next curb and listening to the right next person. Mm. And from Conflict to Courage, what really made me so interested in it was you talk about the inner game. Stop avoiding, start leading. Um, in the positive intelligence body of work for coaches, uh, avoider is one of the 10 ways that we self-sabotage. And it happens to be my number one. And all of those go back to family of origin as you had talked about and why we develop these really great coping mechanisms that help us. Um, but it's really overusing these strengths. My, I love inner peace. I love to keep the peace. And here we are <laughs> looking at, well, how do we stop avoiding the conflict and start leading? Um, and you say it starts with the inner game and then we have the outer game and the culture. So let's start with inner game. Tell us about how to fix the inner game so that you can start focusing on the outer game. 
Well, one of the philosophies of this book, um, and a lot of these philosophies and ideas came from just deep meditation and self-reflection and allowing information to kind of download, which sounds weird and not like that's not a Harvard Business Review thing to say. <laughs> but what I started to uncover was that there is no conflict unless there's an inner conflict first. So if you think about it, what, the way I describe conflict is that it's opposing drives, desires, and demands. So if you think about two arrows going in opposite directions, I can have conflict with no one else being in the room. In other words, I need to have a conversation with Katie, but I'm afraid it might hurt her feelings and I want her to like me. So I, I'm conflicted. So therefore, I now have a lot of mind drama around whether I should, whether I shouldn't. I start looking for evidence of what someone's doing wrong to me. And my own inner conflict keeps me from having an honest, vulnerable, open, transparent, authentic conversation because I've got story around it. And so from the perspective that there is no conflict unless there's inner conflict, my method for myself is to always resolve the inner conflict first. If I have resentment towards someone, I have to resolve that first. If I have grudges, I have to resolve that first because I can't come to someone from the space of I resent them and I want them to change. I have to come from the space of we're, we're going to figure this out. There's things I don't know. I'm willing to feel hurt. I'm willing to feel vulnerability. I'm willing for you to know me and to be rejected because I want to be aligned to my inner self instead of wanting to win an argument. So that's where I come from on resolving conflict is understand your inner game that if you're disturbed, if you've got problems, if you've got patterns of not trusting, if you've got patterns of being paranoid, if you've got patterns of not showing up for people or ghosting people, that, that's yours to resolve before anything else is going to ever clean up. So the inner game is foundational. And so I always talk about the inner game, awareness, intention, um, your deliberate practice, that's your inner game. Mm. Where does one start to clean up their inner conflict and their inner? I, it's really self-awareness, I think, is the first step. And part of that is the self-awareness. We use that word a lot. Some people would say mindfulness, body awareness. Um, it's like that. Have you ever heard that poem, The Whole? Have you ever heard of that poem? Oh, I wish I had it in front of me and I would read it and find it on the Internet. But it, the essence of that poem is. I'm in a hole and I don't know how I got here. Mm. It must be someone's fault. And then it's like, okay, I see a hole. I still fall in it. And the I, hole on the sidewalk. Yes. <laughs> yes. And then finally, it's like, I see a hole and I know I'm going to jump in it. And I do. And then, then I see the hole. I walk around it. I see another hole. So what happens is as you expand yourself and your ability, your capacity to feel the thing you don't want to feel, whether it's resentment or anger or frustration because learning really real learning is about expanding your frustration level to say because you feel aversion when you try to learn something new and you're not as good as everybody else or you feel like you look stupid that's why so many people won't take dance lessons because they feel stupid it's and then they get get a story of I, I can't dance I've got two left feet it's impossible I tried you tried one time and you felt stupid all right yeah. I feel seen now because I think I'm that person I really love this idea of learning is about expanding your frustration level Mm -hmm. why I avoid certain things. I'm like, I can't ever be good at that. So I'm just not yeah. going to do that. But you can, it's just, you've got to be willing to feel horrible things. And when I, when I started to realize this, this was a realization that happened about four years ago. I've always loved to dance um, and I'm not the fastest learner. I'm kind of moderately fast, but not the fastest, but I was taking a, a class called Lindy Hop. And I found myself feeling real frustrated sometimes with the teaching methods. And I found my inner narrative about, I wish they would stop talking so much. I learn better if people get right to the point. And I was, I was noticing my own, like my division, like I want to be here, but like, I can't stand you because of the way you teach. <laughs> and so then what I did was I thought I wanted to quit. And I thought, why do I want to quit? I thought the only reason I want to quit is because of my own anxiety that I feel like this is a waste of time when you're over explaining. And I, I'm kind of a fast processor. So I kind of need things fast and with rhythm to learn. And like, I have a dance teacher now that gets that. He goes, if we go too slow, you can't learn it. We just got to kind of feel it and go with a rhythm. And you got to say one, two, three, and four. Like I can get it from that place. But if you over explain it and use language, like I just, I can't take it. So, um, I started realizing that my growth was going to be about feeling that stuff and just staying there and breathing and like to stop judging the person that was teaching and to just work on myself and how I was experiencing their teaching. Even though I have a different preference, it was really just about my own growth 
to say, I know my preference now. And if I take private lessons, I can say, this is my preference. Teach me this way. But in a group lesson, the majority of people learn better the other way. And so um, I just started realizing that I can do anything as long as I can stand the feeling that's going on with it. I can do anything as long as I can stand the feeling. Yep. It's very cool. And, and when I think about you earlier, you Tessa had mentioned the story, you know, as the source of your suffering. Um, there is so much story there that you shared. I don't learn this way. This isn't what's going to work with me for me, but sticking with it. Uh, can you describe, talk a little bit about, you know, we say self-awareness, but you mentioned mindfulness and like body awareness. Yeah. What does, how does that expand someone's ability to be self-aware? Like I always talk about like surface level awareness versus some of that deeper stuff. Yeah. The body awareness is much deeper and I'm still working on that, but well, in fact, like with my husband, if we start to argue, I feel the urge to just interrupt or shut down. Okay. We're done. We're done because you're too, because you're too aggressive because you're too opinionated. I'm done. Well, because that's really uncomfortable for me, you know, to, to hear that overly assertive idea, which I'm the same way. I do the same thing. So there's projection going on. Mm -hmm. So the ability to say, you know, emotional integrity, I'm feeling frustrated. Can we just take a break? I do want to talk about it, but I'm feeling overwhelmed by your passion. And that's my fault, but like, I just need a break. You know, to be able to really represent yourself in the moment to say, I'm feeling like I want to give up. And I know that's not the truth. It's just how I'm feeling. And I don't have to believe everything I feel. But could we just take five minutes? So the emotional integrity of what's going on in my body that makes me frustrated or makes me feel like it's going to get ugly. Like I, My friends that know me now and people that work with me, I'm like, OK, it's going to get ugly. It, I just know that it's just going to get ugly. So let's just let's talk tomorrow at two. You know, and we laugh about it because I am just a hot wired, fast thinking, get it done, task oriented. And if there's way too much blah, 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 and way too much depth before we get the clarity of the vision, I kind of struggle with that. So um, even on like group calls with Zoom, if there's not good facilitation, oh my goodness, do I have to work on my expansiveness? But how you'll know, how you'll know that you're getting there is the one thing that used to bother you now makes you laugh or you don't care. You just know it's you and it's just okay. Like it, you can just set a boundary or say like, I got to tap out. Like I didn't know it was going to be this long and you're not mad. You just know what you need and you're not trying to change someone else. And that's very profound to say that knowing what you need and not being mad. Um, like I think of things that used to trigger me yeah. that no longer, right. You break a dish, you spill on my couch. Yeah. I'm okay with that. I did not yeah. grow up in a household where that was okay. So for a long time, like spilt milk wasn't, cr was crying, screaming, and lots of, you know, psychological damage for what you've done to my furniture. Yeah. I can, yeah. of course, but um, that's a great way to sort of look at how self-aware am I? Where are areas where I can expand my frustration level and allow and myself? And also a plan. I think a plan sometimes, like I give some tips in the book that I guess I probably haven't memorized enough to like, I know how to do it myself, but I can say that part of it is if you can identify your trigger, if you can take ownership of it, then you can say, what do I wish I would have done? For example, so many of us struggle with like, like maybe rude, a rude person that interrupts or and maybe they're not aware of it, but we, I wish I would have, I wish I would have, I should have, why did they do this to me? get prepared because you already know that that trigger is going to happen, that that person, that is who they are in that moment. They're going to do it again. You already know that. Don't try to change them. That's who they are. The game continues because we keep playing into the same pattern as well. And the game changes when you change your pattern. So stop trying to get them to understand and get them to change. And instead you take the change. So the next time it happens, you say, excuse me, what was that? And you just pause. Like it'll totally take that person off guard or to say, hold up a minute. I can tell we're both getting really passionate, but I'm not available to be yelled at. I'm glad to talk about it. Like you decide what you're going to do because once you decide it's already there and you're not stepping in the hole again, going, I should have. And if you don't decide, and if you forget to follow through on what you planned, there's always, I know some people don't like this term, the circle back. I love the term. I'm going to circle back. Hey, you know what? I got to thinking about our conversation. Can I circle back? I got to thinking. I allowed us to get into a kind of a 
passionate dialogue that really is against where I'm trying to go. And I just want a clean slate. We're both in it, but in the future, here's what I'm going to need. Or I perceive that you were doing X. Was that the story I'm telling myself is that you didn't think my ideas were important. And they're always going to say, oh, not at all. You're just too sensitive. That's always what someone unaware is going to say. And you're going to say, you know, perhaps I am, but this is what I need from you in the future. Like you don't even argue the point. Perhaps I am, but this is what I'm going to need in the future. Hmm. Yes. In the coaching co-active world, we call that a yes and. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and here's what we're going to need. I also um, really appreciate the language around I'm not available to be yelled at. Yeah. Wow. Like that would have been an empowering um, phrase for me to have when I think about workplace drama that I've experienced. I love that you talk about drama. I'd love to dive in a little bit more because as someone who loves to work on the inner game, I'm an only child. So if there's an issue, I just assume it's my fault. (laughs) The most empowering thing I've ever was told by a coach in our very first session was maybe it's not about you. Hmm. So there's the inner game. Tell me more about the outer game and then we'll get to culture as we talk about workplace drama. Yeah, the outer game is really about the skills, learning the skills. Some of the things we're talking about now, like I'm not available, having that in your back pocket, you don't use it all the time. It's just a tool. It's sort of like, do you use a hammer for everything? No, sometimes you need a 916th wrench. Sometimes you need WD-40. Sometimes you need a thread and a needle, right? So it's like, what tool do you need? And yes. Do you- are you comfortable enough to use that tool or is it just your go-to that people know it's plastic and you're just protecting? Because I think it's still about being very authentic to wanting relationship with other people. It's not about winning. It's not about showing you've got all the right words, but can you learn the processes, the skill sets, the mental maps, mind maps to help you navigate? And I think at the core of that, you have to have a strong idea of who you want to be and who you are. Like, what is your leadership identity? Who are you as a person? What do you commit to? Because without that, you're sort of without vision and, and like you can learn skills, but to what end? So for me, when I started my journey, my mission was to improve communication and relationships everywhere. And it was I care. And it's still that is still the legal business name of my company is I care presentations. It was I care consulting. But since I was doing presentations, my coach told me to change it, which was not a great idea because now I consult. But I go by Marlene Chisholm Consulting now. But my core issue and mission for the first 10 years was to improve communication and relationships everywhere. That drove everything I did internally. It drove everything I learned externally. So that's going to be your driver. So I'm sitting in a situation at work and everyone around me has a hammer and they think everything is a nail. What skill do I need to, to bring that forward for them? You know, how do you make that shift? Would it be in a group meeting you think, or like at a, yeah, let's, let's, let's get us in a group meeting. There's definitely, you know, there's probably an elephant in the room and everybody in that room is again, they're carrying the same hammer looking at nails. This is where you represent yourself and you have to be really careful here because if you try to represent everybody else, one of my rules is no playing power of attorney. Well, everybody thinks, everybody's doing, everybody said, others feel the same way. We don't do any of that. We don't do any of that. We say, could I, I want to bring something forward and I'm simply representing myself. My experience here is that we've lost our way. I would love to look at our mission and purpose for being here because what I've observed is sometimes I interrupt. I use a hammer when maybe it's just a question of curiosity. I've seen it happen. I felt it happened to me as well. My commitment is for us to work together as a group. And in my mind, there's an elephant in the room and perhaps no one else feels it, but I do. And so it's my job to bring it up because once you have the courage to just own it, you do take a risk. You take a risk for others to go, God, what's, you know, or you, you can, people can go, wow, I feel the same way. Now, I'm glad you asked this question because when I first started, I joined a board of directors and it was a nonprofit. So you're not getting paid. But I remember like, I was just trying to figure out business and someone said, you need to do that because you meet other business people and you learn about boards. And like, I was doing what people told me to do. And it was horrible and I hated it. It was miserable. We were always voting on things I didn't understand and arguments about things I didn't understand. There was no orientation. And I would, this was my storyline going on. Everybody else is smarter than me and they are having these arguments and they know what's going on. And there was no order to the meetings at all. It was always just popcorn. And me and my limited knowledge of Toastmasters, I saw that, but I still thought they must know something I don't. 
And so um, I, one day out of just pure discomfort and being miserable, I said, new business. I said, I've got new business. I said, my new business is I'm miserable on this board. I'm not enjoying it. I'm not having fun. I don't understand it. I'm voting on things that I'm supposedly liable for. And I just need to move on. And that's my new business. And everybody goes, oh my God, I feel the same way. And I thought, really? Like there's bankers and insurance people and accountants that are all feeling the same way. I'm fresh out of the factory. And I'm the only one that had the courage to say it. Mm. Courage and leadership is also really important. Um, and you t- hence it's in your title, <laughs> from conflict to courage. And it really just sums it up, right? You're in the midst of conflict and you have the courage to not avoid it and lead by sharing what you're feeling in that moment. Uh, wow, what an incredible leadership yeah. moment. And I'm, I come from a nonprofit background. I know how messy they are and how um, I imagine there's a lot of board members that might feel that way. I never thought about how that would feel sitting on a board versus me on the other side of it. It's horrible. It's absolutely, unless you're, here's the thing that keeps a board together is understanding how boards work and going through the protocols and understanding Robert's rules and all the things you need to understand and following those rules and policies. And most people don't feel like they have the time for that. So they get on there thinking they got all this business knowledge and then they they don't understand that they're not each individually the board, the director's boss that all this cross you probably experienced that you know all this i'm i'm your boss because i'm a board member but rea- the reality is that the executive director is there to do the will of the board not the will of one member or four members that are arguing and so like i really could do work in that arena because i feel that they lose their mission and their vision and, and egos and personalities get so engaged in in the problems but you couldn't pay me to be on a board. <laughs> you could not pay. I I want joy and I want life. I just, I will never do it again. Oh, there's some boards out there that aren't quite as dysfunctional, but, um, but you are correct. And uh, you know, the approach to board le- being sitting on a board should be an approach of, I'm going to level up my leadership skills. And I'm absolutely passionate about helping um, boards understand that this is a leadership development opportunity um, and I would love, you know, we could talk all day about boards and shifting it, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> what a great place to, to I just figure know out. I won't do it for where the age that I am and what I want to do. Yep. Like I, just, I don't even want to grow there. You know what I mean? It's like, I just already, I've had the experience. I've seen it. I've worked with people that were in leadership positions that had boards. It's tough. It's a tough world because you've got different personalities and different, you know, if there's not alignment, that's the problem, which is coming back to culture, right? I was going to say, we're, we're, we're dancing around culture. So let's just say it. So we talk about the inner game and developing that. And then there's these skill sets that you need to be able to play in the outer game. But what about culture? Yeah, culture. You know, there's a lot of different definitions for culture, um, whether it's the way we do things, uh, a set of beliefs that govern behavior. When I wrote my um, second book, No Drama Leadership, I uh, had talked with one of the top thought leaders at Dr. Edgar Schein, who's no longer a professor uh, uh, and can't even think of where he was from now, but very high end professor. And I was asking for his blessings to endorse the book. And he had a different definition for culture that has really stuck with me. And he said, it's the way of, it's the way that people behave on the out, behave and get along on the inside to survive on the outside, or it's the way we do things to serve our customers on the outside. And then we have to behave and and get along on the inside. So it's both internal and external. And what came to me was it's not only physically internal and external, it's the invisible elements. For example, when COVID happened, it was an invisible element that forced environmental changes in the culture. Restaurants started delivering, even when they didn't want to before. They started having parking lots turned into, like it changed the behavior, it changed the culture, it changed the mindsets now of how we think about food delivery and restaurants. So culture is not just what we choose to do and how we behave, it's due to influences that are both inside our control and outside of our control to survive. And so culture is a lot more complex than just a set of beliefs that govern behavior. It's everything that hits us both internally and externally. Mm-hmm. And so what, how, do you, how do you help people that have conquered this inner game and they're developing these outer games? How do you help support them through a culture shift? 
Well, the culture shift, and like Edgar Schein said, cultures don't transform, they evolve, which we disagree there to some degree. And he's a bigger professor and all this stuff, so he's probably right. But he didn't like the title of my second book, um, How Enlightened Leaders Transform Culture. He said, you can't transform culture, it evolves. But culture is going to be shaped by everybody, but mostly the people at the top that have the power of decision making. So I'm gonna use it in that context of culture, which again, many things influence culture. I've seen cultures where people at the top do not believe in bad news. And so if they don't believe in bad news, they're telling a story about, we never argue, we're the Stepford wives. We don't really ever fire anybody. Um, they choose to leave. You know, There's all these flowery words and choices we use to describe how we do things around here. And there's a huge elephant in the room. Where there's lawsuits, there's all kinds of things going on, but we don't we don't discuss that. We keep our energies high. So from that culture, if you're hired as a change agent, you will not be able to make change happen because there's already a commitment to we don't have problems. And as long as there's a commitment to we mm -hmm. are stepford wives and we look good and we present good, as long as that reality is going to be supported at the top, you will not be able to come in and say, let me shine the spotlight on these roaches over here. They'll knock that flashlight out of your hand faster than you can say ever ready batteries. <laughs> you know, so um, you're not going to go past what the culture will allow. So if at the top they want a workshop, this is what I see a lot. We need a workshop, our people have drama. So they set their frontline supervisors into a conference room and they put on a big Zoom screen and they've got money provided by the state, especially if they're manufacturing. Um, we're going to take you through training. And there's no coaching. There's no follow-up. There's no support of what they're being taught. So because of that, they got some information and awareness, which can kind of plant some seeds. But they won't last at that organization. If they really themselves have the inner game and outer game going on, they will suffocate. They will die in that kind of organization. So they won't stay. So that's partly where some of the turnover comes in, that if people get developed and they take it upon themselves to be developed, like for where I worked, I was taking it upon myself to become developed. And I was opening up to new thought and new ways of being and new ways to serve. And I went to my organization and said, this was so like out of the box. I said, I wanna do something more and I think it could be here. And I've been here for 20 years. I think I could be a trainer. I think I could be, I think I could do this. I think I, I've got these skills. And the the, C, uh, the plant manager reared back and said, what gives you the credibility to think you could do those things? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that he was a bad person. And I wasn't a bad person for wanting more, but in the structures and culture in which we live, that was unusual. And I was so reaching out of the box that that was, no one had ever heard of that before, of someone coming and saying, can you help me? And I had a structure of knowing that was, if you're in this kind of position, you must be so much smarter than me that if I just go to the great and powerful Oz, you who is on the outside of me could tell me what I could do and you would see that possibility for me. And then I'll, the slipper will fit and the fairy will arrive and the pumpkin will take me to, you know, there was this belief about magic and about other people versus I can ask, but if he doesn't see it, that doesn't mean that's the truth. You see how culture was at work there? Mm -hmm. And I love the way you shared that story. It was very, that the image, it's very, um, very real. And um, the commitment to we don't have problems just stands out for me. Um, whether you're committing to saying we had a problem, but we fired them. Uh, you're essentially saying we don't have problems, right? <laughs> and, I have a saying too, by your choices, you reveal your commitments. Mm -hmm. So by your choices, you reveal your commitments. And I could also say by your programmed patterns because not everything's a choice it's not a choice until you recognize it and therefore it, you can't take responsibility if you don't recognize the choice so when there's this lack of awareness at the top and, and here's how I see this as well and again on boards boards of profit you know for-profit companies we hire or we we recruit board members for their deep pockets and deep connections yet they are out of alignment with who we are in our ideas of leadership, our ideas of humanity, but we've recruited someone because of their money and because of their connections. And then we struggle and wonder why, because we made a decision based on something outside of, completely outside of our values, mission, and vision. I could talk to you all day. <laughs> 
I don't want to let you go. And we're a few minutes over time. So I want to honor your time today. Uh, we had so much a great conversation prior to this. And uh, you, I want to share one more thing that you had, had said that I thought was so uh, revealing is uh, when you're an angry, you interpret it as you need to interpret that as you need more information and that anger is not truth. Yeah. Anger is not the truth, but it's the fuel that can get you there. But if you believe it's truth, you're going to burn up. You are going to struggle for me because I typically have been more of an angry, like I get, ang I feel anger and it moves me and I'm a fast mover and, and just a lot of energy in there. So I've had to work on that. I've actually done some LinkedIn learning programs or one program on anger management because I, I was so invested in changing my own triggers and patterns. And there's now new research that it's somewhat genetically inherited. So mm -hmm. you said you grew up in a volatile, I did too. And I know that volatility, it was like born in me and I, and I, it's my job to change some of the patterns. That's my job to do. Uh, so I relate to people who are embarrassed about their anger or who struggle with what they call an anger problem. I think it's more of an awareness problem and a genetic issue that you can actually start to unravel and, and change. But um, anger is not the truth, but it's the fuel that can get you there. So if you notice anger, if you, instead of interpreting, they did me wrong and I'm done. If you stop interpreting it that way and you start to say, I'm gonna always change my interpretation first. My interpretation is I should have said, I need to set a better boundary. I need to clarify expectations or ask for what I want, or I need to uncover more information. I may not know all of the story. And I can tell you like right now I've got, my mother is in long-term care. You wanna talk about story town when you see things you don't think should be happening and anger that wants to arise and really getting to practice, there might be more to the story. I can get angry later, but right now I need to like get curious. Mm. That has changed my world. Mm. And what stood out to me about that, because I look at anger, I'm like, I don't understand all these people and their anger. I'm all easy breezy. Is that you said avoiding, appeasing, and aggression, they're all forms of avoiding. They're all, they're all avoidance, because if you think about it, appeasing is I don't want to hurt your feelings. So I say, oh, great idea. You know what? I'll get back with you. I'll get back with you next week. Want to go to lunch? I'd love to. Just let me get back with you. Not may have something going on versus I can't, I'm too busy today. Let's put something on the calendar. I'd rather just appease. I've seen organizations have such angry employees and it comes from appeasing. Love your idea. Great. Want you to be engaged. Give me ideas, but really they're not good ideas. And instead of me saying, here's why this idea won't work with our current model. I still love it that you're bringing it to me because it shows me where we need to educate so that you can give us your idea because you're a great idea maker, but you have to understand how that fits into what we're trying to do. So we don't want to have those conversations because that might hurt someone's feelings. We don't want that honesty. We don't want to feel what someone else feels. So we just appease because it's how we feel. We feel better when we appease and their eyes sparkle and they feel good in the moment and it creates a lapse of trust later. So that's avoidance too. Aggression is avoidance because as long as I can shut you down, I've avoided feeling anything more. I get to be right. I've avoided looking inside. I've avoided expanding my inner game. So it's all avoidance. Yes. Thank you for that. That is so insightful. And I think of those three things. And I, I, I just, I, I picture a team I was on where one leader was appeasing, one leader was aggressive. I'll give you a shocker. I was the avoiding <laughs> <laughs> because I wanted, you know, that was my family dynamic. I'm going to keep the peace. Um, right. And that's also just, you know, that's part of my DNA and who I am is right. that I, you know, I can be flexible. I can be easy breezy, but don't be aggressive with me. <laughs> Because yeah, I can just bend away, but it's, it's like being, it's like willing to have all, you know, like I never, I don't really appease. I don't think I ever appease. I have been an avoider um, and I'm aggressive. That's my go-to is more aggressive, which is a defensive stance that comes from energy of, I'm never going to be treated that way again. Or like, I grew up being afraid my whole life and I'll never be afraid again. And if anyone's going to be afraid, it's going to be you, not me. <laughs> and so I often say someone's going to be mad, but it's not going to be me. <laughs> and so that's kind of been my kind of go-to to get over that hump. So I think there's levels of it that all is woven together, but it's all really just avoidance. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing all of your insights. There is no conflict unless there's inner conflict. I, I'm taking so much away. My little inner game and outer game, I think are gonna grow quite a bit just from this conversation. So thank you. Uh, as I mentioned, we started, I have three questions I always ask my guests before we leave and we are totally over. So we're gonna go really, really fast. 
Number one, what's your superpower? Clarity and alignment. Clarity and alignment. What's your purpose? Still to improve communication and relationships everywhere and to help people become the creative force in their own life. Mm, my favorite question, what's next for you? Book launch, um, next level of business, more freedom, um, turning more business down because I can. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's next for me. When does the book launch? Uh, it launches May 3rd. And here is a picture. May 3rd. And where can people find you, connect with you, buy your book, all the good things? Connect with me on LinkedIn and say you saw me here. Just connect. I'll connect with you. Say this is where you saw me. Um, my website is marlenechism.com. So LinkedIn, my website, you can get the book on Amazon, Porchlight Books, if you're wanting for a book club or something, you can get really good discounts there. I just found that out. So that makes it really easy. Porchlight Books. Excellent. Thank you so much. If you're still listening, feel free to give us a like and a follow on Podbean or Apple Podcasts. Follow me over at Outstanding Women Leaders on Instagram or Facebook, or of course, Owl Professional Coaching. We're on both platforms, I think maybe on Twitter, but Twitter's just not really my thing. I don't know. There's a whole war going on with Twitter right now. I'm staying out of that conflict. <laughs> I'm avoiding that and appeasing it for all it's worth. <laughs> exactly. Thank you so much for joining us today. Bye.